Uh, we're missing him today. Take your Bibles, please. And if you don't have a Bible with you or hand uh, nearby, we've got some in the pews around here, in the, in the chairs around here. We've got some King James Bibles you'll be able to follow along with. We're going to turn to two places in God's Word today. Philippians chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians 15. And if you want to stick a card in one, find one and then find the other. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I appreciate the good job that everybody did today in the service. These guys, uh, my boys, just do an excellent job. And they really did a fantastic job today. Don't take for granted at all, Noah, on the piano. What a help that is. And uh, Gabriel leading and singing. That's a real blessing to me. It, is, it makes it harder for me to preach when I do all the things in the church. And it really is handy to have the young guys handing out Elijah McKay, handing out bulletins and doing that short work. I appreciate all the work. And Caleb, I'm really glad for Caleb giving the announcements, preacher and training. And Caleb, you're going to want me to uh, put this mic on, aren't you? It's already on. Oh. <laughs> well, I hope you've had a great week this week, and I hope you, like me, have enjoyed the sunshine. My boys went on a little hike or something the other day, yesterday, and they came back to sunburn. And that's good. We need that vitamin D. It's good to get out of the sun. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 3. Give me a second to find the ball. Acts, Romans, verse 2. Verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 15. All right, and if you found those places, say amen. amen. All right, we're set to go. Let's stand together if we're able to do that for the reading of God's word. We'll begin in Philippians chapter 3. That'll slip over to First Corinthians 15. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 8. The word of God says, Yea, doubtless... And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Listen again, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians with me. Chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are all asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, 
whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? What a question. Notice again, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Today, I'd like to preach a message with the help of the Lord on the power of the resurrection. Paul said that I may know him and the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. Father, thank you so much for the power of the resurrection. Thank you that we can preach it today boldly, proclaim it. Thank you, Lord, that we can know you and that to know you is life eternal. Thank you, Lord, for people gathered today under the singing and the preaching of the gospel, and Lord, in fellowship, and even break the bread, and just enjoying the time together. Now, God, please direct our hearts to your word. Speak to our hearts and help us, those that are saved, to grow in Christ and to grow in faith. Or those that are unsaved, those that don't know Christ, that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that they would surrender their hearts and, Lord, to confess their sin and repent and believe the gospel. Now, Lord, fill me with your spirit that I might be a help to your people and, Lord, to those that are lost. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Would you be seated? The Holy Scriptures tell of the true and wonderful story of the six-day creation. The Bible tells us that God, with his mighty power, created the universe. And we learn through God's word that Moses led the people of God out of the wilderness and crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. I believe that, don't you? The testimonies of God tell how Pharaoh's army tried to follow after the children of Israel, but were drowned in that very same Red Sea. We read of the miracles, of the healing, the walking on water, and wonder after wonder after wonder. But I must say with all certainty that none of the miracles that we read of in God's precious Bible can compare with the miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The Apostle Paul made his life's ambition to know him and the power of his resurrection. Let me say unequivocally and without reservation or disclaimer that I know Jesus Christ personally. I know he's alive because I talked to him just this morning. It is this very miracle the resurrection that the Apostle Paul uses to settle the church at Corinth and persuade them to remain steadfast in the faith and in the doctrines that he delivered unto them. Let us carefully consider today three main highlights of this chapter and apply them to our own lives so that we might be steadfast and unmovable, yes, and even anchored in this crazy wind-tossed world. Let's take a look at this chapter. And see, first of all, number one, that we're saved by the gospel. Saved by the gospel. Look with me at, at 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. What a wonderful, glorious word, gospel. It has the idea, the word gospel comes from, uh, uh, of course, a Greek word that was just simply brought over. It was one of those words that they didn't make it, uh, they didn't try to, come up with a word in the English because there wasn't a word that's, that accurately described it. And so they brought it over. But if we were to use something similar, it would simply mean this, good news. Can I tell you that good news will not be found on Fox News? Good news will not be found on CNN. MSNBC will not tell you the good news. But the Bible tells us of the good news. And what is the good news? The good news is that Jesus died on the cross. That he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. Now, that's the best news you've heard all day. Amen. I mean, I'm glad it's not raining today, but that's not the best news. The best news, you might have thought, well, the best news is we're having potluck today. That's good news, but that's not the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that he was buried, and that he rose again. Notice what the Bible says. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, 
and wherein, uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. I preached it, you received it, and you stand on it. Verse 2, by which also ye are saved. How are you saved? You're saved by the gospel. Notice he didn't say you're saved by the priest. Aren't you glad? Notice he didn't say you're saved by being a good person. He didn't say that. He didn't say you're saved by your baptism. He didn't say that. As much as many churches would love for you to believe that their church is the one that can get you to heaven. That's not what Paul said. Paul said you're saved by the gospel. He didn't say you're saved by your baptism. He didn't say you're saved by being a good person. He said you're saved by the gospel. By your receiving and believing the gospel. Standing in the gospel. What is the gospel? As we said, it is that Christ died. Look with me at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received out of Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. The gospel must include the death of Jesus Christ. That's why people say that Jesus never died because it is an attack on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If God can, if, if the devil can get you to believe, well the Bible is just a good book of moral uh, stories and they're allegories and they really don't mean what they say then you won't have faith in them and you can't be saved. If you don't believe the gospel you're not going to heaven. And that's why the devil wants you to say, well, it's just a good book with some good stories to live by. No, it is the truth. It is absolutely the truth. Somebody, I met a little child today, and mom said, well, the Easter Bunny gave him that egg. He's running around with the egg. The Easter Bunny gave him that egg. How many of you know the Easter Bunny did not give him that egg? You know that? Uh, oh, we got some adults in the room. Amen. I don't believe in Easter Bunny. I don't believe in UFOs. I don't even believe in the tooth fairy. I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I believe in Jesus. Amen. It's not a little lie that I tell my children to make them feel better and behave. Now, you be good. Jesus is watching you. I don't, I'm telling you, I know him. And Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And Jesus died, deader than a doornail. He was dead. He didn't swoon on the cross. He didn't pass out and then come to later. No, no, no. He was dead. No breath in his lungs. No blood flowing through his body. No heartbeat. He was pronounced dead. He was dead for three days and three nights. And Jesus died. Galatians 1.3 says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil <coughs> world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus made it very clear. He made it very clear that no man takes my life by laying it down. It wasn't Pontius Pilate. It wasn't Caiaphas. It, it wasn't any of those political leaders and even the angry mob that killed Jesus. Now, they certainly uh, intended for him to die, and they certainly delivered him. But if Jesus had chosen at any time to come down off the cross by his own power, he could have and would have done it. But he chose to go to the cross, and he did die. He said, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, had a Christ died. Hey, listen, you either believe it or you don't believe it. But be careful with that choice. It's a life or death. You either believe that he died or you're lost in your sins. Galatians says he died for our sins, that he might deliver us from this evil world. How many of you know it is an evil world? Are things getting better and better or worse and worse? The older people know how bad it is. The younger people might think it's great, but every year, every generation, everything gets worse and worse and worse and worse. We're not getting better and better. We're getting worse and worse. And Jesus died to save us from our sins. Not only that was Christ died, but, but also that Christ was buried. Look at verse 4. And that he was buried. And that he was buried. <coughs> Jesus Christ had to be buried uh, to fulfill the scripture that he would rise. That he would be in a bar of tomb. When we baptize people, we have... Uh, if this arm were to represent water and we have someone come down and stand in the water, when we baptize somebody, they're making a public statement publicly, I believe Jesus died on the cross. When we lay them under the water, we're making a public statement that Jesus was buried. When we raise them out of the water again and we say, raise to walk in newness of life, we are letting people know it's a public statement. Yes, I believe he died. Yes, I believe he was buried. And praise the Lord, I believe he rose from the grave. And we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the death. We believe in the burial. Jesus died. He was buried. And then, in verse 4, the best part, and then he rose 
again the third day. You understand the meaning of this? It wasn't that somebody else raised up Jesus from the dead. It wasn't that God empowered a prophet to come and to raise him. That had been done before. It wasn't that. It was that Jesus raised himself from the dead while he was ten. No one had ever done that. The Bible calls him the first fruits of them that slept. He was the first one ever to raise himself from the dead. Hell could not hold him. Hell had no right to hold him because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And Jesus was there unjustly. He was there in the heart of the earth without any justification whatsoever. In fact, Pilate washed his hands in front of the crowd and he said, I'm free from the blood of this man. He said, I find in him no fault at all. And yet he crucified him at the demand of the Jewish leaders. And he died. He died for you and he died for me. He was buried. And he rose again. I want to read something to you that I listened to the audio of last night. Of an old black preacher by the name of S.M. Lockridge. Has anybody ever heard that name, S.M. Lockridge? Uh, he could preach, as, as, of course, as a black preacher only could do. And I wish that, that I could just play, and I probably should just play the recording for you. But he said this. He said, you remember back during the 60s? The offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpens and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising, church, because the Bible says the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions, like, who assassinated God? <laughs> What coroner was called? Who signed his death certificate? Who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased? And what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified I'm a member of the family? <laughs> there are those that would like to say God is dead today. God cannot die. But Jesus died. You say, preacher, I thought he was the God-man. Listen, that is a conundrum that we will never understand when we get to heaven. He's all God and he's all man. As God, he said, that I am that living water. As man, he said, I thirst. How can you understand that? You have to believe that. That's not to understand, that's to believe. God cannot die. But Jesus, as a man, could die. You say, well, he wasn't God. No, he was God. And when he rose, he rose forevermore. He is the God-man. He became man for us. He became sin for us who knew no sin, so that we might be made the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of God in him. He died on the cross. He was buried, and he rose again. Number one, we're saved by the gospel. We see that in verses one and two. Number two, we're sure to go. Let me back up for a minute and just remind you that Christ did rise from the dead. It absolutely happened. It's not the tooth fairy. It's not Santa Claus. It's not the Easter Bunny. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who created this place in six literal days and probably didn't even break a sweat. I, I don't believe it tired him out at all. He took the world and hung on nothing, Job says. He did all these things. Look with me to Romans chapter 6. We'll come back to Corinthians, but turn with me just quickly over to Romans in chapter 6. Christ rose from the grave. For sake of time, I won't do it, but I can tell you we could spend all of Sunday going to the places in the Bible where it talks about the resurrection from the dead. Just hold your place there in Corinthians. We'll come back and take a look. But I want you to see in Romans chapter 6, and verse number 9, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. I always thought it was amusing when we read of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and how the Jews thought about killing him after that. <laughs> and I thought, 
I mean, Jesus could raise him again if he wanted to. <laughs> but you know, Lazarus died later. We don't know when, but he died later. Jesus raised him from the dead, but he died later. Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He rose from the dead, and he will never die again. The Bible says he dieth no more. God's not dead. He's alive. He's alive forevermore. He cannot die. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him. And so we turn back to Corinthians, and, and we notice in chapter 15, And verse number four. And then he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Look with me down at verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, and you all heard me preach that today, I'm still preaching it, and I'll never stop preaching it. If Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? How is it that some say that that doesn't exist? How can you possibly believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but not in that we will be resurrected? This last week, my wife Stacy and I were by the bedside of Sister Helen as she left this world and passed into glory. And there were even some that asked, well, how did they get, you know, who comes for them? Does a family member come? And what, what do you think happens? And, we open up the scripture in Luke 16, and the Bible says, And the beggar died and was carried by the angels. Abraham's bosom. Now, how could I be so confident in that? Well, on our ride home, and Brother Steve, you were with me and heard that conversation as I talked to Miss Helen. And I asked her, Helen, are you counting in your Greek baptism to get you to heaven? She said, No. I said, Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? She said, Yes. I said, Are you counting in Jesus to take you to heaven? She said, I am. I said, are you sure you're going to heaven? She said, I know I am. And a couple of times I think she said, cool. (laughs) (laughs) She knows Jesus. And when she stepped out of this world and drew her last breath, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that according to God's word that her faith is what saved her soul. I also shared with some, much to their chagrin, I'm sure, that were around that most people when they die don't go to heaven. Jesus said straight is the gate. Remember Matthew 7 when we looked at that? Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. Few there be that find it. But I believe Sister Helen found it. I believe she's better off than you and I are. She doesn't have to put up with this mess anymore. She's enjoying the streets of heaven. She's enjoying what she's... uh, uh, she, she's not dealing with the sickness and with the pain. And, and I'll tell you what, that lady did not miss church for anything. And if anybody did miss church, she gave them what for? And I always said, I'm glad she's on my side, man. I wouldn't want to be on her bad side. She, she gave people what for? She liked me, thank God. And I'm glad she understood that. I'm glad. Well, what kind of a preacher would I be if I didn't believe in my heart and in my soul that there was no resurrection? What kind of a preacher would I be? You know, if there is no resurrection, let's shut off the lights and let's quit wasting our time. And let's go do what we want to do and eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Why would we do any of this if it wasn't true? But it is true. It is true. The real reality is over there. This is just a tiny little... A uh, moment in time, the Bible says, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. If you could have gone to a 12-year-old Helen and asked her about time and eternity, it wouldn't have mattered to her nearly as much. But by the time you get up in age, you look back at your life, you that are over 60, you that have passed 70, you know it goes by like that. Everybody told me with my kids, they said, hold them tight. They grow up so fast. And you say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. And then you get there. And then true, the Watsons know, just like that. Just a moment. And it's all gone. It's all in the rearview mirror, and it's gone. When we get to the end of our life, it's going to be just like that. And I believe in the resurrection. I believe this is the short part. I believe the long part is yet to come. I believe in the resurrection. Christ was buried. And he rose again. Turn with me to a Revelation chapter 1. Revelation, the end of the Bible. We will hit Corinthians one more time before we dismiss, but let's go back to Revelation 
chapter 1, the revelation or the revealing of Jesus Christ to John, his beloved disciple, in the very last book of the Bible, of Revelation, in chapter 1, as John heard the words of Jesus Christ. Look with me at Revelation chapter 1. I want you to park there at verse 8 just momentarily. I am Alpha and Omega. That's the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Isn't it interesting that he calls himself the Almighty, and we know that it's Jesus Christ, and we know that God is always called the Almighty? All the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons just don't know what to do with verses like this. Why is Jesus calling himself the Almighty? You know, I read an article, I shouldn't do it. I read an article, I think it was NPR. And they said that it's interesting that Jesus never claimed to be God in all of the Bible. That's what they said. And yet here he is in the book of Revelation saying, hey, you want to know who, what would you think of me if I said I'm the Almighty? Would you think that was blasphemous? But Jesus says he is the Almighty. Is that blasphemy? No, because it's true. They killed him, they crucified him because he claimed to be God. The NPR hasn't got a clue about much. Look with me at chapter seven, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. There are people who say, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to give God a piece of my mind. I don't think so. Not that they can spare it, amen? Well, if I was God, well, thank God you're not. <laughs> Oh, well, why does God let, listen, when you create a planet and you make people and you do all these things, you make the rules, and we'll go ahead and believe you, amen? But God made it, and God decided, why do good things happen to bad people, or why do bad things happen to good people? There are none good to God. God decides how it goes. And he fell at his feet as dead. That's what you'll do if you get in the presence of God. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. Listen carefully. Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive. How long? Forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. He'll never die again. Amen. He said, I am he which liveth and was dead. And I'm alive forevermore. When, when Helen got her new body, as the Bible says she did, she'll never die again. If you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you've only been born once, you'll die twice. You'll die when your spirit leaves your body, and then the Bible talks about the second death, which is being cast in the lake of fire, which burns forever and ever. Most people don't believe in the lake of fire yet. They will believe. There are a lot of believers in hell today. A lot of believers. Jesus Christ rose again. So we're saved by grace, number one. Number two, we're sure to go. Look with me back at Corinthians in our text. And we're in chapter 16, or chapter 15. Look at verse number 35. This afternoon after we eat, I plan on going through a little bit of this chapter. I hope you'll take a look with us. But first, uh, verse number 35. It's a great chapter. But he said, but some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may have chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. He says, some say, well, what body does it get? Uh, and, and he says, thou fool, don't you know? He's telling us, don't you know what you put into the ground isn't what comes out? Anybody ever plant a garden? My wife has a little garden going in the house right now, little plants in the windowsills, little tomato seeds. I can tell you this, what she put in doesn't look like what's coming out comes out different. We know what it is. We recognize it. We know it's a tomato plant, but the seed that went in doesn't look like what came out. 
And can I tell you this? The, the body that we put in the ground isn't one that's going to come out. The one that comes out is going to be different. It's going to be better. It's going to be an improvement. What would you rather have? A little seed? Or the tomato plant with like five juicy red tomatoes hanging out? He said, thou fool, what you put in, what you put in. And, and you know what? That seed didn't go to work until it died. And then it could grow. You're not going to get that new body until the old one is put down. And it'll happen. It'll happen. A new body. A new body. You see, we're saved by the gospel, and we're sure to go. If you're saved, you're sure to go. You can't stop it from happening. Save, save, save. Verse number 50, look with me there in the same chapter. Verse number 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit <clears throat> the incorruption. Nobody died and went to heaven and came back and wrote a book about it. Books have been written. Don't get me wrong. Books have been written. Money has been made. But nobody ever went to heaven and came back and told them. He said, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I love it when the church will take that verse and put it on their nursery wall for the nursery and church. So this is our, our verse for the nursery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> We're not all going to die. Now, some of you, how many of you know somebody that's died and, and you're sure they're in heaven? They've died and they've passed on. How many of you know somebody that they died and you're sure they're in hell today? I know that too. He said, We shall not all sleep. Do you realize that what Paul is telling us is it's no guarantee that you and I are going to die, but it could be? And we'll take a look at it later, not all now, but. But, but let's look at what could happen. We shall all sleep, but we shall we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not everybody's going to die. Look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In Thessalonians, it talks about how that we'll go to meet the Lord in the air. Before I'm done preaching this sermon, it could be, but that trumpet will sound, and we're out of here. We're done. Never to die, but meet the Lord in the end. How quick, quickly will it happen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Before I'm done preaching this sermon, we could all be out here. I say we all. You know something, Brother Scott, what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted, I've, I've never done it one day before I die, or I open the rapture. I hope I get to do this. I've always wanted to be in a church service. Somebody falls asleep. And we all say, and we all tiptoe and leave that one joker in there. And then get on the sound system and go, I mean, one of these days, I'll probably get sued for, you know, trauma. But can you imagine? <laughs> you know something? It's going to happen about one time. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen about one time. Airplanes are going to crash into buildings. Cars are going to swerve off the road. Operations in the hospital are going to be over just like that. The doctor will disappear. You don't necessarily always know who's saved and who isn't saved. But one day, we shall not all sleep. But even if we don't die and get buried in the ground, God's going to give us a new body. We're going to get it on the way up, I believe. And we'll meet the Lord in the air. We're sure to go. If you're saved, he said you're saved. If you're saved, you know you're saved, you get a new body and a new home. And then, not only are we saved by the gospel and sure to go, but we're steadfast by grace. Let's skip all the way down to the end of this chapter, and let's look at verse number 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, and, and I really hate to pass over all this great, wonderful doctrine in this chapter, but for sake of time, just look at verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, therefore, whenever you read the word therefore in the Bible, you should ask yourself what it's there for, all right? Therefore. <laughs> therefore means because of everything I just said. Therefore, whenever you 
read that word, therefore, know that there was something very important. And the, the, the situation that he's talking about here is the fact that there is a resurrection and that we will be changed and we are going home. And because you and I know that, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmoved, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Steadfast by the grace of God. You understand I'm not running a popularity contest. How many of you figured that one out already? <laughs> I'm not running for office. I believe this book, and I believe I'm going home. I believe it. And I want to be sprinting when I hit the finish line. When Brother Bond died, he said, Brother Kevin, I want to finish well. 80-something years old. And on his deathbed, he called for me. His family called and said, yeah, Brother Bob's asking for me. And I went there. And he had told me that at least three times in person. And then one final time, as he was there in the very place where he died, he said, I just want to finish well. I said, Brother Bob, you finish well. Wonderful church left there. Family that knows the Lord. Missionaries that are being sent out. But see, he was no fool. He knew that a lot of times in the last days, when men get older and older, or women get older and older, he knew. Some people start well, but they don't finish well. And Paul said, seeing all these things, therefore, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always hanging back. That's not what he said. Always abounding, going forward. Caleb was an old man in the Bible when he said, give me that mountain. We sing that song, I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow. Listen, Christian, it's not time to say, well, we're in the last days. Let's just hang back and see what happens. No, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Understand this, that, that trumpet could sound at any moment. There are people that I know that are absolutely ludicrous in the scriptural belief and do not believe that we will be raptured out of here. They believe that the church will go through the rapture. And they believe that because they don't believe this. This says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's such a time when you think, not the Son of Man, and I'm looking forward to the rapture. I'm ready to go. The power of the resurrection. You see, because Jesus resurrected, we can be resurrected. If he hadn't have done it, we couldn't do it. That's why it's important for us to believe in the power of the resurrection. Would you stand together with me? We're going to pray. I'm going to ask Noah to come to the piano. In a moment, we're going to sing song 295.